going to record this thing on the cloud because it's the year 2020. Hello, everyone. Welcome to TGI, a reading series that has been operating here on Zoom on Friday nights since the end of March uh, and originally stood for the great indoors. But it turns out there's like 19 other things called that because it's a good idea. So uh, now it stands for whatever I want. And today I'm going with Turtles Girth Increaser, I guess. Um, my name is Rich Cresswell. For those of you who don't know me, I am an audiobook narrator and uh, general creative human being who lives here in Queens, New York. For the past six months, I've been saying who normally lives in Queens, New York and is instead in the middle of nowhere, but actually I'm in Queens, New York today. And um, very briefly, I'll say this. Uh, it's weird being back in the city. It's a little stressful. Everything's just vibrating a little higher. So if I'm a bit... Uh, odd today. That's probably why. I went around today counting, um, giving people scores. A one was uh, you have a mask and you're wearing it correctly. A two was you have a mask, but your nose is out. And a three was you just don't even have one. Um, I only got up to four ones in a row. So I have a feeling New York is going to struggle. That's all I'm saying. And the reason I'm saying that is partially just to vent it. And then partially also that um, the reason that we've been doing this for anyone who this is the first time is because of coronavirus. You know, we couldn't meet, we couldn't all be in the same room. We can't uh, do the usual things that people do when they are creative people who like to share their work. The cool thing is that because of that, we have been freed from the shackles of geography. We can go anywhere. We can do anything. We can have people come in from all over the place. So tonight we will have people from as far removed actually as Japan. Uh, so without any further ado, I think we should probably just get into it. I will just say a format essentially is as follows. Uh, we have four readers tonight. Uh, people generally read for 10, 15 minutes. Um, I will then come back on. I might ask you a question. I might offer a response. This began as a way of segueing to the next reader and has become uh, me enjoying attempting to interview people a little bit. Or I just usually I just say what, it, your, what your piece made me feel, honestly. So uh, steal yourselves for that. Uh, gird your girdable portions. And um, I am going to introduce our first reader. So our first reader tonight is Sherry Goldhagen. Is it Goldhagen? Awesome. Uh, she is the author of the novels Family and Other Accidents and In Some Other World, maybe, as well as the YA novel 100 Days of Cake. She has worked as a writer and editor for an awful lot of publications, including Cosmopolitan, Us Weekly, Life and Style Weekly, Salon.com, and Penthouse, and is currently the editor-in-chief of Women and Weed magazine. A fellow of both Yaddo and McDowell, she has an MFA from OSU and a BSJ from Northwestern. Though she recently moved to Florida with her husband and daughter, she will always be a New Yorker. Sherry, you are unmuted. You can take it. Okay, thank you. Um, so let me see. If I bring this up here, can you see me? It doesn't matter. <laughs> I guess it doesn't matter. But I'm still there, right? Yes? Yep, you're still good. Okay, even though I can't see. Okay, excellent. So um, this is a part of a novel I just finished that feels like it was written about a different world, and I might actually now send it in the past, um, but uh, Megan knows about this. Um, so this is, it's, um, it's basically it, the four adult children of a senator from New York, um, and this is from the perspective of the second son, Owen, who's a film composer, um, and his girlfriend is Roma, and it's kind of from the middle of the book, but that's, I think you don't need to know anything else, so. Okay, there's, a, there's some, uh, you know, there's some coarse language, so be, be warned. Um, my sister says her husband saved my life, but I have no memory of it. The way Maddie tells it, she and Dan found me on the bedroom floor going into shock with the fever of 104. I believe them, a scar from sternum to navel that backs up their story, but I have no recollection of them being in my apartment at all. I do remember waking up with my stomach on fire and churning at four in the morning and finding the bottle of my Lanta on the bedside table empty. Remember stumbling into the main living space where Roma was doing a series of plies using the side of the piano as a bar. 
I wasn't so ill I didn't notice she was wearing nothing but silk panties. Nervous, I asked. She'd been a professional dancer since she was a teenager, but that night would be her first performance as a principal with NYCB at Lincoln Center. She was playing the stripper from Balanchine's Slaughter on 10th Avenue, a sexy role with kicks and crazy hair that she loved but also hated. No, Roma's eyes narrowed, pissed at me for finding her raw and exposed. Just leave me alone. Shrugging, I turned to the open kitchen and rooted around the high gloss cabinets until I found a box of baking soda. I dumped a few spoonfuls into a glass of warm water, fought back a gag at the bitterness. Okay, maybe I'm a little nervous. All her practice affectations were gone. Roma David was all Rosalind Davidovich from Toledo, Ohio. She offered a smile that was somehow both shy and sly, and I remember very clearly thinking that I loved her. Sorry for being such a thunder cunt, she said. Come back to bed, cunt, I said, and remembered being happy when she did, her hand cool and light in mine. I remember waking up in spectacular pain a few hours later and feeling worse and worse as the morning wore on. I remember Roma in a black yoga outfit reminding me I'd promised to attend her final dress rehearsal at noon. I remember Pat Kiernan on New York One saying something about the debate in a surprisingly close Senate primary scheduled for the next day. I remember almost passing out against the glass walls of the shower and hobbling to the walk-in closet in a half-hearted attempt to get dressed. But aborting the mission after putting on one sock and crumpling into a tufted leather bench a designer had convinced me was absolutely necessary five years ago. Roma came in and arched an eyebrow. I reminded myself that she was nervous and I used to gnaw my cuticles to a pulp before performances at Juilliard. Come on, oh, she whined, I need you today. I'm sorry, I said, my stomach is killing me. Your stomach's always killing you. This was valid criticism. For the last few months, my digestive tract had felt like it was digesting itself. But when, thing re when, when things reached the point where I was motivated enough to do a Google search, results suggested the issue was likely lifestyle-based, and it seemed silly to see a doctor who would just tell me to eat better, drink less, and quit smoking. I had used it as a reason to skip the gym for weeks and to bow out of a dinner with Roma and some photographer friend on Monday. Bro, I feel absolutely awful, I said. I'm sure you'll magically be fine tomorrow for the debate, she said. I have to scroll down here. You think I want to go to that? At least your thing has women in leotards. A sigh laugh came out of her nose. You're saying Francine Ford doesn't do it for you, baby doll? Mm, the populism's a turn off. Oh, can you please just take a shit and some Pepto and be there for me for once? Her tone was softer, but the for once bothered me. Mentally, I tried to list all the times I had been there for her, but my stomach eating itself made it hard to concentrate. I told her I'd taken the last of whatever antacid we had hours ago. Rolling her eyes, she left the closet. 10 minutes later, she was back. By then it hurt so much, I'd gravitated to the floor and breathing had become an extremely unpleasant task. Here, taking a bottle of Pepto-Bismol from a plastic bodega bag, she threw it at me. I didn't even attempt to catch it and it landed at my feet. Even though she'd lobbed it underhanded and without much heft, the plastic cracked and the pink liquid oozed out on the hardwood floor. Aurora ran through it, leaving a trail of cutesy paw prints. Seriously? Roma shook her head. Fuck you. I was done trying to remember how performances had made me hate Juilliard. I don't have time for this today. With a gesture of utter exasperation, Roma said she would clean up the mess when she got home and grabbed her bag of gear. Wait, don't go. I'm already late. Just be there tonight. She spun on her he the heel of her sneaker. I think I remember pleading with her to stay, telling her I was sick and needed help. But maybe I didn't. Maybe I just watched the all-star label on her shoe as she left. The puddle of Pepto grew into a lake and then an ocean that swallowed me up for all those missing hours. Everything after that is a blur of professional hands, plastic tubing, sirens, and antiseptic odors. When I was cognizant again, Maddie was in an evening gown, stained in my bloody puke, and Dan was explaining how surgeons had suctioned the bile out of my abdominal cavity and patched my stomach back together. I believe things happen the way they say. I just don't have any memory of it. There is one thing I recall, clear as the crystal star over 57th Street at Christmas. As the professional hands were saying things in a language beyond anything I could process, there was a familiar scuffle of people moving with authority, expensive loafers on linoleum floors. Dad, I asked, and there he was, all six foot four inches of him, larger than anything or anyone else in the room, in the world. I'm right here, my father said, unfiltered concern across his face. It's going to be okay. He took my hand, and I remember loving him so fiercely then, the way I had as a child. But it's possible I only think I remember that because I've seen photos of it. 
As I was delirious and drugged and being prepared for emergency surgery, the campaign photographer snapped a picture of my father holding my hand. Whether or not my father specifically authorized it, he didn't object to its use. I was still in surgery when his team announced he was pulling out of the debate so he could stay with me at the hospital. The only thing I care more about than the state of New York is my family. The picture and the statement were on the cover of both the Daily News and the Post and above the fold on the Times. It was the top story in all the local broadcasts and got a fair amount of play on CNN. New York Senator cancels debate after son rushed to hospital until a school shooting in Florida diverted all national news resources. The story was on a constant loop of New York One's headlines and it came on the TV in my room after surgery when my whole family was there and Roma wasn't. The punch of seeing that photo broadcast throughout the tri-state area sliced through the blanket of morphine and the nipping pain underneath that. It had been almost two decades since I'd realized my father's blustery rhetoric was every bit, about, every bit as much about his ego as it was about altruism. But even so, I'd never really minded when he talked about us in speeches. Sure, sometimes I'd grumble about being paraded out for photo ops, but I was happy to help out where I could. Up until that moment, my fevered face and my father's intimate concern blazing across the TV screen, I'd never felt used. Until that moment, I'd always really liked my dad. After that, not so much. I didn't want him there. Didn't want any of them. Certainly not my non-maternal mother or my brothers. Kevin, because he didn't have the skill to hide how creaked out he was. JD, because I'd never wanted him anywhere. Definitely not when there was a catheter shoved up my dick. Not Dan, who had apparently vomited all over while naked. Not his colleague, New York Magazine's top gastroenterologist and the doctor wings he'd assigned to babysit me. Not even Maddie, my non-twin wonder twin, who never liked my girlfriend, but kept offering inane excuses as to why Roma wasn't there. She probably forgot to turn her phone off after the performance. Maybe she's not answering because she doesn't recognize my number. I never pick up for unknown numbers. You know, she might have assumed we went to Beth Israel. The only person I wanted was Roma, who was nowhere to be found. Mentally, I gave her 24 hours hours from the time she left me on the closet floor. If she got there within that window, sorry, I have to scroll down. She got there within that window. I told myself I'd listen to her explanation with an open mind, but a second later and I would end things. Nothing could possibly justify not checking in after that long. And then I watched the institutional clock on my room tick off the seconds, filled with righteous indignation and mounting despair. I will stop. Uh, all right, Sherry, thank you so much. Uh, really interesting. I mean, obviously, uh, obviously, yes, things have changed yeah. slightly now regarding going to the hospital and things, right? But, but I, I will say that um, the beginning of that, the, the reality of like, when you're feeling ill, and everyone else is trying to like go about their business around you, and how difficult and stressful that alone is. And I think especially now, um, anybody who's like noticing any form of potential symptom within themselves is probably being like, Ooh, what was that? Wait, what was that? Why did I just cough? What am I doing? You know, so I, I really felt that. And then also, yeah, I mean, uh, what Juliet just commented there, uh, political, political evidence of altruism. You know, it's interesting because politics obviously is a huge part of everyone's conversation all the time now it's like the new sports it's just what people talk about um but what i think is really interesting is outside of that it kind of speaks to an issue i've noticed with people in general which is that people now regular human individuals are really fixated on like building their brand and portraying themselves in a certain way especially on the internet marketing themselves as an individual um I don't know if I exactly have a question, but I guess what I would say is like, is this, is that theme with the father kind of using his family to look good? Is that something that kind of runs through this? Cause they're all children of a Senator, correct? Yeah. I mean, I think to some extent, it's really just mostly about a family. And when I was writing the book, I was always like, I, the dad could be like the commissioner of baseball or something, because again, it's just something that, um, but then it sort of became more solidified. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's just, you know, they all have this complex relationship with him. Um, and it's, it's really just about family dynamics. I write a lot about families. Um, so That's... it's a different kind of family. <laughs> um, no, I mean, everybody has it. Everybody, everybody has some understanding of um, even people who get along with their family really well, 99% of the time, there's still that 1% of the time, right? Everyone can identify with the difficulties and maybe strains from family relationships and the stress that comes in especially like being adult 
children of somebody because then you have this weird dynamic so that makes a lot of sense so is this something you just finished you said um i finished i mean i've been working on this novel since i don't know like for 15 years like i wrote two other novels in between it that have since come out and have now been out for it's just it's been it's my great white whale um but i did i did finish it um and now i'm just kind of revising it but i mean it just it feels weird to like try to sell anything right now so i feel like Mm. i'm just taking my time with the the finishing revisions but it's okay at this point, it's just finishing it for me more than anyone else. But um, that That's but, the first step, right? So yeah. anyway, thank you. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing some of it with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. All right. All right. Uh, we're going to transition onwards. Also, just want to mention, if anyone knows anybody or is in publishing or anything like that, just so everybody knows, we hang out for like an hour before and after this. So if anyone's into like, I don't do networking, I'll try to make you laugh. I guess that's networking. I don't know. But if anyone wants to hang out and swap information, feel free to hang around afterwards. We'll, we'll chat. All right. Uh, all right. Our next writer is Chelsea Witten. She is a poet and essayist based in Cincinnati, Ohio. She is the author of Bear Trap, Dancing Girl Press, 2018, and is a PhD candidate at the University of Cincinnati. Her poetry and prose have appeared in a range of print and online publications, including Copper Nickel, Cream City Review, Poetry Ireland, The Atlanta Review, and Forklift Ohio. She is the recipient of the 2018 Sandy Crimmins National Poetry Prize and was recently selected as one of two finalists for the 2020 Adrian Rich Award. Raised in North Carolina, she spent her 20s in New York and now lives in Cincinnati with the poet Matthew Yeager. Chelsea, you can take it away. Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm sorry I was a couple minutes late. I was having technology issues, but I think I am all sorted now. I'm so excited to be here. Um, uh, my partner, Matt, read a few weeks ago and I was, I was just so impressed by what a refreshing um, conversation you guys are having over here. So I'm just happy, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Um, All right, so I'm just going to kind of start reading poems. Um, And yeah, I don't know. I I think I will will have more to say once I get going. All right, so this is called Poseidon. It's a prose poem. A far-flung sky, a coast, a nape of thorns. This ocean lives two lives at once. It has a struggle in it. You want to be thought dangerous, so you learn to swear. The kids raised here go north, or they are never happy. Weddings happen all the time, but never has there been a 50th anniversary party here. It is said that your eyes were as blue as shallow water when they named you. They are darker than the deepest trenches now. Your mother pays you $20 to unclog the gutters. You buy a radio and lash it to the rafter in the back shed where you spend most school days lying in a hammock you liberated from one of the empty summer homes your mother cleans. A girl in your class named Sarah gives you airplane bottles of tequila and weed when she can. In exchange, you pretend to be her boyfriend around her parents and give her rides in your stepfather's truck out to her real boyfriend's trailer inland. All the trees here are either dry, scabby pines or else imported from somewhere else to make the town look beachy. All the men here are either work broken or leisure ready. Both kinds wear bow shoes and keep their shirts untucked. They love to spit into the sea. For your part, you are almost always lying wasted in your shed, or else you are mowing the lawns of the rental properties, listening to no effects on your disc man, watering their gated gardens, maintaining their private dunes. It is said that your mother named you Poseidon when she first looked into your pools of eyes, but later changed it to something sensible when she couldn't sleep for dreaming of your death. Knee deep on a squall day, she would find herself facing the ocean, singing to the bundle in her arms. Then from the deep, 
an improbable riptide would grip her, shift the sand, and she'd be taken under. Your pink shape would slip free of her swaddle, would pull out fast and fast to see. She would invariably wake up screaming. She took some pills. She gave up coffee, gave up chili, slept with one quick hand inside your crib, and still the dream each night, the same ending, until she changed your name to Steve and left your father. So, um, it was sort of a weird, um, I don't know, a weird, uh, I don't know, alter ego. I, I, I went to college for a while in a, in a beach town in North Carolina, and I was always sort of fascinated by people who lived there year round and always kind of like, fantas like fantasizing about what, um, what it would be like to grow up in a vacation town like that. Um, all right, so um, this one, is um this one is sort of based i mean it's pretty it'll be pretty obvious but um we moved to cincinnati ohio uh, a couple of years ago to to do uh, graduate school and for some other reasons as well and uh my husband matt is uh you know pretty pretty handy um and uh he i got him a miter saw for christmas uh one of the first years that we were together it was like a big gift hauled it uh, in, a, in, a, in a cab uh, from where it was shipped in Manhattan. It was a whole thing. Um, but anyway, um, as he was kind of using it and I was watching him use it in the garage in Cincinnati, um, this poem kind of started to materialize. That was a big introduction to a poem that's not that complicated, I'm sorry. All right, this is Initiation with Miter Saw. I want you to show me where to put my hands in this garage of bug-specked pegboard, innumerable boxes of parts, near where the old red stain, blood sacrifice or antifreeze, symmetrical as a Rorschach lobster, bifurcates the floor. I want to be shown, your hands over mine, how to keep the wood steady, how not to jump three feet when the saw roars a life, how to rip it irrevocably. My hands hate to commit. They prefer half measures, are in the cool habit of gripping things loosely. They especially shrink from what can't be undone. I want to know how one earns it, your nerviness. If there's a badge for follow through, I want to see where you keep yours. Is it shelved down here in a box marked parts? Or is it upstairs, folded in your bedside book, along with a note from your father? I'd like an idea of the standard procedure. How close must one come to the actual blade? Does a held breath help? Would you call it a mostly forgettable experience? How bad would it be if I just closed my eyes? I want only to have already done it, to be already holding the separate halves. All right, so it's an initiation with miter saw. Um, this is also my first uh, Zoom poetry reading and it's definitely different. Um, so I appreciate your enthusiasm. I just kind of checked to see if people are still with me. Um, all right, so, um, so lately I've been playing around a lot with, um, with, you know, uh, classic forms, um, you know, imposing a lot of structure on poems that are, um, that have subjects that are maybe, um, less than literary, I guess. Um, and, uh, this is a, uh, this is a pantoum that I wrote called Requiem for a Fuckboy. And um, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's pretty self-explanatory, but um, you'll start to kind of hear the pattern. There's some repeated lines throughout. I don't know, I'm sure you guys are already super familiar with this form, but anyway, this is Requiem for a Fuckboy. You slept here with your late beard on, your bed hair and your bare bod rank. My windows wore the peach of dawn you felt like hell 
you fell, you sank. Your bed hair and your bare bod rank, you passed out on the shattered tiles. You felt like hell, you fell, you sank, your head against the laundry pile. You passed out on the shattered tiles. I found you there, your shoes still on. Your head against the laundry pile, your wallet lost, your money gone. I found you there, your shoes still on, your pockets turned out on the floor, your wallet lost, your money gone. I hit you opening the door. Your pockets turned out on the floor, a ball of paper, pens, loose coins. I hit you opening the door. The corner got you in the groin. A ball of paper, pens, loose coins. Asleep inside your sad small mess. The corner got you in the groin and grabbing blindly at my dress and rolling in your sad small mess you stirred. I'd half hoped you were dead. But grabbing blindly at my dress, your eyes split open ugly, red. You stirred, I'd half hoped you were dead, but now, ursine and blank with rage, your eyes split open, ugly, red. I'd loved them in another age, not now, ursine and blank with rage, but then, blackbirds lighting on me. I'd loved them in another age, untroubled, I became their tree. Back then, Blackbirds lighting on me made me feel singled out by fate. Untroubled, I became their tree and fortified to bear their weight. And I felt singled out by fate when you returned night after night and fortified to bear your weight, a stoned saint in the changing light. So you returned night after night and slept here with your late beard on, a stoned saint in the changing light, my windows wore the peach of dawn. All right, so I don't know. Um, I, I guess I'm still doing okay on time, right? Do I have time for one more? Yeah, one? totally. Okay, great. Um, so, so yeah, um, I don't know if you guys, how many of you guys were here when Matt read, but um, we were, we were looking for our cat who was lost and he is still lost and he is uh, maybe probably lost for good. Um, and so we've been kind of grieving over that, you know, sort of a, sort of a big thing. Um, and it's, you know, it's been interesting. It's been, it's been, it's been, you know, we're still in it, but um, I was looking through my old poems and trying to think of what to read for this. And I had written this poem years ago about a different cat, about an, uh, an ex-partner's uh, cat that I had heard had died. And I was reading it and it's just sort of amazing how, I, I'm sure you guys have experienced this. You write something as a younger person and then you come back to it years later and it feels weirdly prophetic of like things that you couldn't have understood then, but maybe like do now. Um, and anyway, this was kind of that experience for me. So I guess I'll close with this. This is called Elegy for an Ex-Cat. Your cough became our revelry, inciting a daily sideways sprawl, sheets flying, bird feeder outside the window, knocking. And while we spun records and drank wine from plastic cups, you lay a sphinx cast in bronze, tasting the hairs on your forearms. You spent evenings by the baseboard, stunned, spitting at our mutiny, our sudden juts, our sweeping limbs. And in the midnight white silence of fans and stilted breathing, I know I saw you, dark and soft-lined, blinking Morse code at me with your light trap eyes. It is not that I miss you. I do not miss your unscrupulous hiss or those quick, petty swats, all that senseless, ceaseless bathing, oddly noisy and done with great, wet, slobbering strokes. Least of all, I miss the way you hated me, dispassionately, as if you couldn't be bothered to commit to loathing, 
as if you knew I'd soon enough be nobody to you or to him. As it is, I've grown accustomed to the rise and shrink of passing shadows, night black through my days. How strange of yours to yearly lengthen following the sun. All right. Wow, Chelsea, thank you so much. Um, yeah, as I, I have, uh, it's interesting because everything you read gave me a really different look at what it is that you do in the sense they were all very different. Um, I wanted to start with the first poem. Um, I've thought exactly the same thing, actually. I, so I'm originally from North Carolina. We grew up going to Emerald Isle every year mm -hmm. and uh, on the Outer Banks. And I actually, yeah. later on when my family had moved I had a high school science teacher who I found out was from Atlantic Beach on Emerald Isle. And I was like, wait, people are from there? Right. What are you, like, because you never see anybody. And this, this sort of world of, it's not really misery so much as it's, sort of, it's almost sounded like almost as though you imagine them as like ghosts in a weird way. Right. Yeah. Um, especially the, the southern, the southern beach towns where um, the entire economy is so based around tourism, um, you know, and there's all kinds of, yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. you, you sort of wonder about the people that, that live there all the time. Um, yeah. And also like, you know, so much of that was just like weird details borrowed from like my own adolescence, I guess. Sure, of course. I mean, but it, but it, that's that's what you know makes it real enough when you recite it or re when we read it for it to get into our heads properly. So it's it's really nicely done. Um, the uh, the other, but I just want to say quickly, we did have Matthew on a, a few weeks ago, and between his ode on the McRib and your requiem for a fuck boy, <laughs> I just want to like come to dinner at you guys's house. <laughs> and just listen while you talk because that's incredible it really really like the the blend of like humor and sincerity and thoughtfulness and then like a return to humor it's it's a very, very like like it and and it really worked really well um and i think also uh, i am not a a poetically educated man i i am not familiar with this form but i can say uh that the how do I put it? The sort of cyc cyclical nature, in a way, almost like waves moving through it. Yeah. Um, it does kind of lull you into this sense of almost sense of reverie, where you're just, and then you're sort of listening to this about this this crummy dude who's like, <laughs> sort of still in your house. It sounds like. Uh, I guess I don't have a question. I might just be complimenting you in a really long, complicated fashion. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> those, those forms with, with repeating lines um, can really like stretch out a single moment, and that's kind of what mm. I like about them, right? Like it, it sort of fractures a moment and gives you a lot of different ways of looking at the same mm. sort of span of time. Sure. Yeah. Fun no, too. That makes a lot um, of sense. You know, it, it, once you learn the pattern, you know, almost anybody can do it. So I encourage you know people to lean into those complicated forms. They're actually really liberating. Well, sure. And, and to some extent, you know, I've talked a lot to poets uh, on this show and, and on the podcast we do that's related to it about trying to get those moments into, or trying to get all this meaning into this little tiny package. Um, right. And it strikes me as placing restrictions on yourself might in a way like help you to do that in a new way. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think we, a lot of times as writers, get um, really bogged down in our sort of expectations for what we're going to write. You know, you sort of, mm -hmm. you sort of uh, even if you go into it with the best of intentions, once you get a good line or a good, I, I, a good scene or a good description, you kind of start fantasizing about what this could be. And um, a lot of times that's kind of poison for, for mm -hmm. you know, your, your flow. Uh, and I think really like putting constraints and structure on on yourself as you're writing can kind of take your mind off of that. And you, and mm. you end up being, or at least I end up being more inventive with, you know, with less, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Sort of if you have to take the perspective of like, okay, I need to get this expressed, but 
it needs to end with a word that rhymes with this and I only have like 11 syllables or whatever, I'm right. just making something up. Right. Yeah, then that, that really changes your process. And that, that's, that's really cool. And I think everybody who's tried to create anything, if you, I think everyone, I saw tons of heads nodding in the gallery view when you mentioned, when you write that one good thing and then you're like, ooh, this could be, and then for me at least, that's when I'm about to ruin it personally. Exactly. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So you're feeling yourself too much. Exactly. Like you're just yeah. like, you know, exactly. Yeah. So, so I, I, I try to like, you know, trick myself away from that sort of stuff. Well, it, it's working out great. So thank, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm probably going to go back and, and listen to Requiem for a Fuck Boy like eight times and try to figure <laughs> out why I was giggling so hard. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. Of and course. Thanks. <laughs> we can chat after if you need to or want to need to what am i saying all right i'm like i told you guys at the beginning i'm extra weird today or a different kind of weird than normal so thank you for bearing with me our next reader is megan Wynn. originally from philadelphia pennsylvania uh megan Wynn teaches english at a small liberal arts college in ohio where she lives with her husband daughter dog and cat she has an MFA in fiction writing from Ohio State and has won grants and fellowships for her fiction from the Ohio Arts Council. Her fiction has appeared in The Sun, Story Quarterly, The Southern Indiana Review, and elsewhere. She is sort of a vegan, sort of a deadhead, and as recent events have shown, definitely not a plumber. Uh, without any further ado, I have... Oh, there she is, top right corner. Megan, you can unmute yourself and you're good to go. Great. So I think I hit unmute, you can hear me? Great, okay. So I'm gonna be reading from a fairly early chapter in a novel. Um, the current title is If I'm Not Here, and I'll be reading from the perspective of a teenager named Marie. It is 1968, and I think since it's early on in the novel, this is all that you need to know. So here I go. Compared to Marie's household, Fran's bustled. Fran is her new friend. For one thing, there were six of them, two parents and four kids, all teenagers. For another, they had a dog, Smith Jones, a reddish brown mutt whose nails clicked at a mellow pace as he hunted for crumbs along the Maddox's uncarpeted wood floors. Marie had never been in a house without worn carpeting in every room. She'd never known such an easygoing dog. She would scratch him behind the ears, Marie, as if she'd been around dogs all her life as if the daughter of the fearful Rosie Calhoun could become a dog person. <laughs> hey, Smith Jones, Marie would say, amazed by how normal she sounded. The dog had gotten his clever name from Connie, the older brother she had yet to meet. The Maddoxes were Catholic, but they weren't Catholic Catholic, like Marie's mother, with her frequent exclamations to St. Anthony, the vial of holy water next to the Vicks vapor rub, the scapular under her house dress. The Maddoxes didn't have a portrait of the Sacred Heart in the living room, last year's Palm Sunday leaves braided and tucked behind the frame. They didn't bring up diseased relatives on anything like a regular basis. They didn't hold the door open for suffering, didn't set death a place at every meal. Fran's mother, Ombretta, which was what she told Marie to call her, had not Jesus Christ, but a portrait of her own self above the sofa. A tiny, stylish woman, she worked part-time at the Estee Lauder counter at John Wanamaker's. About once a month, she left brochures about divorce, how to stop it, how to cope if you couldn't, lying around on the furniture to be seen by her husband, Robert Allen Maddox, a tall Welshman who ran his own construction crew. Robert Allen was a World War II vet and an avid outdoorsman and Eagle Scout the shed out back full of his well cared for camping equipment. Most weekends, weather permitting, he camped in the Delaware Water Gap, often with one or more of the kids, sometimes without. Ombretta stopped going a long time ago, as soon as she'd figured out not only that Robert Allen would never take her dancing instead, but that, that he didn't care if she came. Sometimes she wished he'd cheat on her with another woman, at least then she could compete. But when your husband preferred mother nature to your small and singular embrace, you were sure to lose. Whistling, still in his work dungarees, he went around the house picking up the divorce brochures. Into the trash they went. 
just what the hell do you think you're doing with my materials? Umbretta stood at the stove, her tone not unflirty. <laughs> Calmly, Robert Allen said, I don't like this crap laying around in front of the kids. Stirring the tomato sauce, Umbretta laughed mirthlessly. It happened right in front of them. Fran, Marie, eighth grade Tommy, seventh grade Teresa, Teresa's gossipy friends. Seated at the kitchen table with their government and geometry books, their literature homework, they shared looks. Condiment jars knocked against each other as Robert Allen swung open the fridge. As soon as he left the room with a bottle of beer, Ombretta set her spoon, oh, set her spoon on the um, spoon holder. Oh, I, I deleted something by accident and rescued her materials. The kids, the kids, she mimicked, brushing off the brochures. Other people live here besides the kids, you know. You have to meet Connie, Fran kept saying. LaSalle was only 30 minutes away, but he was never around when Marie came over. I guess he can get away with a lot more when he's at school, she said. Are you kidding, Fran said. They stood before the giant mirror in the best bathroom in school. Fourth floor, five stalls, windows that opened wide, checked irregularly by the most elderly nuns, the ones too old to teach, who shuffled along the halls with one ear cocked, ever listening for their names, not their names as sisters, but their true names, their girlhood names on the lips of the Lord. Smoking up there was a cinch. They'd already split a cigarette and now primped before the mirror. My mother lets him do anything, Fran said. Like what? Like get high, that's what. And when he and his stupid friends come up from the basement all hungry, she's already heating up food for them. I'm talking entire pans of ziti, lasagnas. Combing her hair, Marie spoke to her reflection. Then why does he stay away? Beats me, probably there's a girl. Oh, her comb went still. Who was she kidding? This college boy was out of her league. But she can't be as pretty as you, Fran said. I mean, look at your cheekbones. Marie eyed her cheekbones from different angles as Fran explained that being pretty wasn't about makeup or skin, but bones and eyes. Marie had knockout eyes. Marie made them big and zoomed in toward the mirror. She supposed they were of an appealing size, bigger than her sister's anyway, but they were gray, a shade just shy of blue, as if her pre-birth soul had tried for the good stuff but hadn't had enough money or connections, just like in her post-birth life. So I have some zits. Fran did her combination eye roll shrug. So what? I've got good bones and good eyes. Not as good as yours, but good nonetheless. They stood together before the mirror, Mimri trying to see past her too tall forehead, her, her pointy chin. Zits come and go, Fran said, but bones are for good. Together they launched a bone strengthening campaign, vowing to drink milk with every meal. At Fran's, they wrapped their after-school apple wedges in thick slices of Swiss. Marie had never imagined one could eat apples and cheese together. She was ready to retch as she took the first bite, but it was delicious, both crisp and creamy, sweet and salty. Wooden cutting board on the coffee table, revolver spinning inside the big stereo cabinet, no one home but themselves and Smith Jones asleep on the sofa. Marie felt elegant, European. She ran her fingers through her hair, hoping she and her bones would make a good impression on this Connie Maddox if he ever did show up. It took him until Thanksgiving, an event for which Marie abandoned her family to eat with Franz to meet at long last Connie Maddox, whom she fell for right away, literally, tripping down the basement steps landing at his feet. Head wreathed in pot smoke, he sat at ease in a chaise lounge that belonged poolside, not in a dimly lit basement that smelled of burning marijuana. Surrounding him on mats and the floor itself slumped his fellow freaks and followers who pointed at her and cracked up. Connie smirked. With his round wire rim glasses and swarthiness, he seemed to Marie part scholar, part pirate, a combination she suddenly realized was her exact idea of sexiness. His hair, dark and wavy, brushed his shoulders. His olive skin showed no trace of the acne that took its toll on his three siblings. Unlike most of his friends, he had no facial hair, because why would you want to hide a face like that, Marie figured. He wore a navy blue suit vest unbuttoned over a blue work shirt and a long necklace of teeny tiny beads of red, yellow, blue, and white. His feet were filthy, the wide frayed cuffs of his jeans silken with grime. Tufts of coarse hair grew atop his big toes. Jesus Christ might have looked like this the day before his weekly bath in the River Jordan. 
those toe hairs. Connie wasn't a boy, he was a man. You must be Fran's friend, he said, handing her the joint where she sat, still in the spot where she had landed. Yeah, backside and left elbow quite sore, about to have her first ever hit of marijuana, she could think of no witty retort. From the record player behind him, a day in the life ascended to its turbulent climax, an out of control elevator, rocketing up and up, at last bursting through high rise rooftop into the vast hum of sky. She thought of the Pyrex butter dish she had set on the dining room table at Ombretta's direction only minutes ago, that these hairy nonconformists could exist in the same house as that butter dish gave Marie courage as she brought the joint to her lips. Holding steady eye contact with Connie, Marie discovered that marijuana tasted as wonderful as it smelled. She didn't even cough, was quite proud of this as she handed the joint to Connie, who shook his head and pointed to the boy next to him. So she handed the joint to that boy. Damn, that boy croaked, holding in smoke. She lipped it. That's all right, said Connie. She's got nice lips. Thank you. All right, Megan, thank you so much. Uh, that was really, um, you're, you're, I think people commented on it in the chat, uh, but your, your use of details uh, really like managed to very specifically set the scene very quickly, which I think is great. The other thing, the thing I really like, it made me sort of return to, even though obviously I don't know if you, I, I, Personally, I don't have the experience of having been like a teenage girl, um, but I think the thing it made me think of instantly was how sometimes alien it was to like go to other people's houses and see their family moving around and the level of interest you can, and this almost mythology you can invent in your head about their cool older sibling. Right. <laughs> and I love, yeah, like, and the setting, the time setting is perfect because you have these hippies you know, and then, and everybody else is sort of, you know, sounds like fairly buttoned up straight ahead, you know, like, honestly, maybe wound a little tight is the idea. And then there's sort of this, this um, young man who represents um, freedom, maybe, I guess, in, a, in like both a, a biological um, desire sense and also a like uh, counterculture behavior sense. I have to ask the question, as always, is this based on anything that you experienced yourself? <laughs> it is loosely based on a lot of my family's stories. Okay. So, and in fact, I'm here with my mother, who uh, <laughs> okay, really loosely based on, so this is so funny for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I don't have to ask any more detailed questions if you prefer. Oh, no, no, go for it. Oh, no, that's, I was just joking. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, you, you can, you take family experience, everyone takes their own experience things, uh, right, in the sense that um, uh, the way we understand people even it comes out in our writing. So I think um, it's inevitable to some extent that we use parts of people we know. Uh, but, hmm, I kind of want to, hmm, I almost want to ask, has your mother read much of your writing? Um, not really. Yeah, I mean, she has for sure. I mean, she's read stories yeah. that have very much have a lot of her life in them. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I just asked because what no, was go that? Ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. This is so this is the only issue we have with zoom is that it like puts a noise gate on as soon as someone else starts talking. So we keep cutting each other off. I thought it but um, I think it's great that your mother's there. Uh, and, and, and I think it's really interesting our family's relationships to our work. Um, because sometimes there will be a great deal of interest. Sometimes there will not be. Sometimes there might be a huge amount of interest in one thing. Um, has there been anything you've managed to, whether it's publish or, or get known for that, that has like been the thing that cracked through to not just, I'm not going to pick on your mother, your whole family. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure. What, what do you mean exactly? Like that they uh, are to or. Yeah, just is, is it, I find, you know, with myself, I'll, I'll just, I'll share a little bit briefly with myself, you know, I did a bunch of self-published nonsense audiobooks, and then I got one from university press and my father was like, Oh, a real one. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so has there been any moment like that with your own family? 
know, you know, I think I'm still waiting for that moment. Um, I'm waiting for this book to get published and then all the people that it's loosely based on. <laughs> can't wait to see what they do. That's entirely fair. And I'm beginning to suspect that we need to figure out a way to have like a TGI, uh, like, you know how bars have ladies night? We need to have agents night one day or something or publishers night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Get them, get them all in here. Anyway, thank you so much, Megan, for sharing. Really, really thank great you. stuff. And, and hopefully we all get a chance to read it soon. I hope so. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> all right. Our final reader tonight, we've had a couple people who, you know, this is a marker of how long we've been doing this now, is we've actually had a couple people who've read twice, right? Because we've been doing this now, uh, we're, coming to, well, we're coming towards five months, I think. And it's every week. I think we missed one week. There's one week we like needed a rest or something. Um, but this next reader, I think it's particularly exciting that he's reading twice because he's reading from such a long distance. And I think that's really cool. So I, without a further hubbub from myself, uh, Michael Frazier is a poet and educator. He received his BA from NYU where he was the 2017 poet commencement speaker and co-champion of CUPSI. He's performed at the New Yorkian Poets Cafe, Lincoln Center, and Gallatin Arts Festival, among other venues. His poems appear or are forthcoming in Tokyo Poetry Journal, Counterclock, Construction, Visible Poetry Project, and elsewhere. His writing has been supported by Callaloo and a Brooklyn Poets Fellowship. Currently, he's a staff reader for the Adrat Journal and a 2020 Seventh Wave Editorial Resident. He lives in central Japan, where he is working on his first book about his mother, and he can talk for days about anime and Christ. Without further ado, Michael, you should be able to unmute yourself. Okay, hi, everyone. Nice to see everyone. Am I the only one who, even if it's a reading on Zoom, I, I get the shakes? Like, every reading, I get the shakes, so... It's a privilege to be here. I think it's always great to be able to share and I don't take this lightly. So I'm just gonna jump right into it. I like that we were just talking about, are you feeling better, Michael? Yes, I have. Oh, you remember. Yes, yes, yes. I was, yeah, I feel completely better. Thank you for asking. Um, I'm glad we were talking about mothers and family and like what, uh, like, how do we navigate that? Because I'm writing a book about my mom and it's getting to the point where I'm coming to the end of the collection. And now I can hear the worry in her voice. So I'm like, yeah, I'm almost done with the book. She's like, oh, I can't wait to read it. <laughs> um, so I think soon we'll have to have the conversation about like, what exactly am I writing about? What, what am I sharing? So I'm gonna read some prose poems from what I'm working on and it's about my mom. Okay, and the first one is called Mother and Son as Oyakodon, number one. Uh, so I think I mentioned last time, Oyakodon is a chicken and egg rice dish. And so now I've turned them into prose poems. I pour the trinity into the frying pan. Dashi, kneading, soy sauce set to simmer. Mom says, mmm, that sure smells good. I ask, how you smell my cooking through the phone? You want me to overnight you a bowl from Japan? She go, boy, since when you got overnight money? Besides, I don't want no cold bird, soggy egg, stale rice. And we both laugh, louder than the chicken singing in the pan, than the bubble and pop of egg fusing to bird like new skin. My rice cooker rings, ding dong. Mom asks, who you got coming over? Who you giving my plate to? You know I never had a hot meal while y'all was kids, always warming something up, always last to eat, always. I've heard this before, but I don't interrupt. We FaceTime, and my first attempt at Oyakodon is a little dry. Don't choke, she laughs. I spill rice on my lap. I'm 24 and still got a hole in my lip. Mom starts, tell me why, and she stories, and I listen, and I'm fed. Mother and son as Oyakodon, four. I wasn't there, so I must use language. On a bed as white as fresh cooked rice, my mother lays alone. Doctors and nurses mill around the room. They say sciatic nerve, blood clot, unilateral paresis, undiagnosable. My mother says, don't give me no medicine. Don't y'all know how to pray? 
He is praying on your mother, Pastor warns. A woman who can see visions in her dreams. Best believe the enemy wants her unheard. I hadn't heard from her in more than three days. Palpitations in my chest, that's how I knew. The full moon was an excedrin without water. One sheep, no sheep, finally fall asleep to ASMR. Wake to commercials asking, Doka, Iki Takunai? I have Google flight alerts for New York City. I have a savings and is dying to be spent. I oil my face between my cornrows, rub the ashy from between my fingers, sing, sometimes I feel like a child. She texts, don't worry, just war. I wore worry like acne. When we FaceTime, she asks, ain't I supposed to be the one sick? I always forget the Japanese characters for kindness are shinsetsu, meaning parents and cut. But how could I forget? If I wasn't cut out of my mother, she would have bled out. Mother, my first cry, mother cut out of the picture. I've been unmarried and a mama's boy for so long, it's all I know. Yes, I know it's a kindness when a child leaves the nest, but it's also a kindness when a mother says don't go and her boy brings his head to her chest. Between Housewives of Atlanta gifts and Minnie Mouse onesie selfies, John Gray YouTube sermons, reminders to put the whole armor on before leaving the house. She admits she wants me to rely less on her and more on God, but wasn't it a woman who gave the gospel legs? I know what they say about boys like me. Your opinions won't remarry my mother, won't check on her if it's been more than 48 hours, won't leave poems or Bible verses in her voicemail, won't listen to her complain about CNAs or suburban deers as she commutes to work. If you love someone, let them go. Why? So those are three poems from the series I'm working on about my mother. I'm trying to lean into prose because I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to lean into like, people call it autofiction, I guess, like fictionalizing my narrative as a way of defense, but also as a way to explore different possibilities. So that said, my last poem is something new. Every time I do a reading, I try to write something new to challenge myself and like make myself meet a deadline. So I hope it's <laughs> followable. Okay, so this is the last poem. Uh, I tell my mom I got to have the new super sky top black and red patents, and she says, all you got to do is stay black and die. I wasn't old enough to work, but was old enough to question everything. So I asked why I got to die. And she said, that's a question for God and stop talking back. I look back on what I call black proverbs and I can trace this proverb to a poem by Langston Hughes about his landlord. He says, all I got to do is eat, drink, stay black and die. I get it. I love me some boneless buffalo wings and the way I sweat couldn't go a day without water. But who says I got to stay black? And don't get me wrong, I love not burning after being in the sun for five minutes and love the way a little cocoa butter and light make me shine, but I don't know, maybe I want some more options. Don't want to be put in a box that will be lowered underground and die. Just last Sunday, we learned a couple prophets never tasted death for their time. And what does buying shoes have to do with this? It's not like I can shoot my eye out. I want to cop a fresh pair of kicks and all my dad can talk about is how cops get kicks out of messing with black boys who look too slick. Yes, I know I don't skate, but did you see Tyler with his hair? Yeah, I'd follow him off a cliff. His shoes are so fly, there's no way he'd fall. My mother says you'll look like one of them jerking boys on BET. My father says, besides, Back in my day, if I wore something that showy, I wouldn't make it home with them things still on. Maybe I'm just hard-headed, stubborn, a question for God. If I die, do I stop being black? If I'm black in heaven, will I know it? Will I shine different? If my blackness is thanks to melatonin, i.e. the sun kissing me dark, will everyone in heaven be black since we'll be up under the sun forever? Do white people have to stay white? and die, they don't do neither of those right. 
I can't keep up with the Kardashian skin complexion of the week. I still can't believe they gave Dylan Roof a happy meal after he killed nine black saints. In Madison, in a government building, they're protesting the lockdown with AK-47s, while 87 protesters are charged with felonies for peacefully protesting on a lawn for Breonna Taylor. I prayed for Jesus to come back in my generation just to prove my mother wrong. If I'm raptured, then that means I didn't die, LOL. But still, what to do about the skin? I love the outdoors too much to avoid the sun. If I touch my face too much, I break out. So I'm sure bleach wouldn't be kind to me either. Suppose, after all, all I got to do is stay black and die. Die, not murdered not ghosted, not hung, not shot, not stabbed, not choked. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michael, so much. Uh, usually I respond from the first thing to the last because it's kind of how I try to organize it in my head, but obviously that's, wow, uh, intensely powerful. Um, both the, I'm trying to think of how to put this, the, you perfectly captured two things, one of which I understand and one of which I don't. The one that I understand is struggling with your family, you know, and your parents. And, and I loved that you said, um, you know, I can't remember the kid's name, but so-and-so has him. And then the next line was, yes, I would follow him off a cliff. Like, no, you don't understand because when you're when you're a kid, these things are incredibly important. You know what, what my friends are doing with this, and then obviously the part I, I do not understand is is the experience of Black Americans. Um, you know that's not something I have, but um, we've been we've talked a, lot, a few times about how how people are sort of like people like myself or or people who have not had that experience are gaining some awareness, and I think those those two juxtaposed images, which a lot of people have been doing, but you did so skillfully is the men protesting being asked to stay home so that they won't get sick, carrying machine guns into a municipal building versus people sitting down to raise awareness of the fact that a woman was murdered. And that struggle um, to reconcile those two things while people are saying that this is a, a fair and free environment we live in, right? Um, I guess I don't have a question about it so much as I, I guess um, I almost want to ask you what, what's your experience like obviously you're you're in Japan right now you're, you're sort of removed I mean obviously you're not emotionally removed but you're physically removed do you feel like this has given you any sort of different insight into what's been going on here yeah it's been a little like dissonance because like yeah, like protests were happening in my hometown and they got a little violent and then George Floyd's funeral happened and then mm -hmm. and I'm starting school in Japan. So I'm teaching while all of this is going on. Mm -hmm. And so for me, uh, yeah, it has been dissonance is the word I keep thinking about is how like I'm there, but I'm here. But also, mm -hmm. you know, protests have been happening globally, too. So it's been nice to then bring this into a Japanese context and how it spurred new conversations about uh, race and identity that I don't think would have happened if, if this hadn't started in America in May and June, I guess since, since the early spring. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I think that's really well said. And I could imagine that dissonance of it's sort of... Um, my experience with some of these things has been when I, when I'm at a protest at something and it's immediate and it's here, it's like this. And then as I'm walking away from it, I'm like, wait a second, why is the world still going on? So I can imagine that that might be kind of the feeling you're getting. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, the distance does allow me to process it more. I think if I was back in America right now, I'd be in the heat of it, protesting and just constantly being on like 10. So I think in that way, I guess the question, so yeah, in that way, I have the privilege to kind of just explore what I'm feeling and like kind of see more global, like, like zoom out more. Mm. Um, but yeah, I guess another que a question I do have is like, how, how, yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, I, I, I really appreciate you sharing. And then I did, I did just want to jump back to the poems about your mother as well, because they were so, so, they so beautifully 
conveyed your relationship with her, I think, of this sort of, um, the sense I got was this very loving and, but also teasing and maybe slightly, you know, she likes, sounds like she likes to poke at you a little bit. She does. She, <laughs> I just called her. It was like five. She just called me like five in the morning. And I, I answered the phone. And I was like, hello. And she was like, oh, so that's what we're doing today. I don't get a good morning. And then I was about to say something smart. And then she was like, don't even say something smart. Because I'm in the car with someone else right now. So I was like, dang. <laughs> five in the morning, I'm getting attacked. <laughs> that's amazing. That's great. I mean, I think that's, that's awesome. And I think also, you know, figuring out what, how we feel about our parents, our families, all this stuff. Writing is such an incredibly powerful medium to do that in and, and to understand. And I just, I think... You are doing such a wonderful thing while, by doing it while she's still here mm. and, and while she'll be able to read it. Because I think mm. that's something a lot of people, a lot of people don't, I, I'll just keep it on me. I did not take the time to really examine my relationship with my mother until after she was gone. And mm. I kind of sometimes wish I'd gotten to talk to her about it a little bit. So definitely keep going with that. And we really look forward to hearing more of it. I, I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much, Michael. Oh, I'm so glad. I just want to respond. I'm so glad you said that because I'm doing a book club starting late this summer and the theme is like moms. So I'm mm. collecting a bunch of like books that are dealing with mom like Blood by Rachel McKibbins and My Mother Was a Freedom Fighter by Aja Monet. And I want to read one a week. So mm. if anyone is interested, please connect with me on social media. I'll be posting about it soon. But I agree. I feel like we wait until they're gone. And especially men. We don't like, mm. I feel like whenever I talk about men like talk to men about their moms it's never like it's never like the lessons you learn it's it's like very two-dimensional i really want to like dig deeper into that well and not just mm -hmm. have like a paternal like lineage that we draw on mm -hmm. yeah no that makes a lot yeah, of sense yeah so book club yeah so. no keep us posted on the information we can share it on here as you get closer to it uh whenever you're going to start it just let us know we'd, we'd be happy to to help you find people and that sounds that sounds awesome to me so all right thank you so much you. All right. Thanks, Michael. With that, uh, we are coming towards a close here on TGI episode, whichever. Um, I'm doing that with my arms because my shoulders hurt because I have neck problems. I told you I was weird today. Um, at any rate, I'd like to just first of all, thank all the readers for coming, all the audience members for coming, everybody uh, who comes onto this and participates to some extent is incredible. Um, and I hope we can continue doing this. Uh, for the foreseeable future, we will, because, yeah, as I said towards the beginning, you know, until there's a vaccine, I think Friday nights we're going to hang out at home. Uh, I don't know about everybody else. But, um, yeah, with that, I guess we're going to open it up for anybody to hang out and chat and do whatever it is they would like to do, network, say hello, give feedback to the readers. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at TGI cast. You can also listen to, we've been doing a podcast. This week's episode will be out probably tomorrow because we had the power outage and it's been a whole thing. And as Trina just said in the chat, if you guys know somebody, readers, audience members, anybody's, if you yourself would like to read something, we're always taking recommendations, submissions. This thing has been built on friend of a friend. Um, I don't, I mean, we had, we had a huge Ohio contingent today. So I think we may have to thank Yaley. I'm not sure. Um, but, but this is how it works. Hook us up with people. We would love to have people hang out. We'd love to get more involved, help people be creative however they want to be. With that, I'm going to press stop record.